Hello everyone and welcome to a brand new video. Uh, this is, actually I'm not going to introduce it just yet because uh, I have a, a brand spank, spanking new screen that I'm going to put up in a second. Um, but my name's Caitlin and I'm going to be joined by my good friends uh, Gear3 Gaming or Jack McKenzie. Jack say hi! Whoa! That wasn't hi, you failed already. Um, and I'm also joined oh. by Real C Whitfield, Chris. Hello Chris! Good morning. Yay! Okie dokie. So, uh, the format of this brand new thing that I've come up with is a format that I have unashamedly stolen from a series called Puppet History on YouTube. Uh, it has exactly the same format, uh, but I'm going to be doing it with a PowerPoint presentation and they do it with a puppet show, basically. Uh, so go watch Puppet History, they're very funny, very good, um, and I have completely yoinked their format. So. Uh, let's go! Uh, basically what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be telling a funny story from the history of racing and uh, I've got my two funniest friends, uh, the, two, the two funniest friends that I could find anyway, um, and uh, they're going to be butting in, making witty remarks and answering my questions as we go along. So guys, are you ready to learn? Let's do, I mean... I, I like to know that it's good to hear that we are the funny friends other friends are available but um but i think we are ready to go also looks aren't everything honey <laughs> in fact i'm counting on that <laughs> other friends um... are available okie dokie the the name that i've come up with for this majestic invention of a youtube video is speed and power point um, Jack, would you like to do your Jeremy Clarkson impression? Speed and PowerPoint. Indeed. A sort of mediocre impersonation. A spin-off of Game Show Grand Prix. Game Show Grand Prix. I mean, it isn't really, it's just that I've got the same cast members, so I was like, yeah, let's bring that we back. Got, we, got, we got called out recently for not doing an episode of Game Show Grand Prix in like two years. <laughs> we did, we did, but it's okay because look, we got we got swanky animations. We. <laughs> <laughs> you love to see the PowerPoint animations. It's fantastic. I've I've gone full old school PowerPoint here. So, can you guys see my mouse as well? Yeah, my cursor. Yeah. Good, good, because I'm going to be pointing to stuff. Okay. First, let's start with a very British fa phrase which you may not be aware of, Gordon Bennett. To demonstrate, here is my granddad, and here is a rock. Uh, you can see I've labelled them, there's my granddad, and there's a rock. Uh, my granddad walks towards the rock, and... Ow! Oh, Gordon Bennett! Okay, question one. Aside from being a uniquely British swear word, who was Gordon Bre Bennett? Uh, was he A, a racing driver, B, a racing mechanic, C, a race organiser, or D, a racing driver's secret boyfriend? Ooh! Okay, Jack, I'm going to go to you first. Which of the four do you think he was? I do want to win this. It would be an interesting answer to pick D, but it probably isn't. Uh, so I am going to go... I'm going to go... I'm going to go with, with A. He was a racing driver. Chris, what do you think? Well, first of all, uh, when he hit that rock, he definitely could smell what that rock was cooking. Um, second of all, um, I think he was actually a racing mechanic. Okay, so we've got an A and we've got a B. The points go to... Oh, I, I didn't put in an answer page, but the points go to neither of you. The answer was C. He was a race organizer. I thought I'd put in a page that said the answer. Oh. Wait, what is, he goes the, next page? Page. <laughs> what is the next page? The answer, the answer was a man from the 1920s. Yeah, well, before that, actually, as, as I'm sure we're about to find out. Okay, so... Indeed, this is Gordon or James Gordon Bennett Jr., commonly known simply as Gordon Bennett. He was a rich man who wrote for the New York Herald, founded by his father, James Gordon Bennett Sr. Funny how that works. Uh, he was also a celebrated yachtsman and, of course, a motor racing enthusiast. You guys liking my graphics? I yes, just realized quite. he looked vaguely like Daniel Craig if he grew a moustache. Yeah, I can see it. 
Hmm. Perhaps he can play um, Gordon Bennett in the um, in the biopic of him. Hmm, that's a very good idea. We should we should pitch that to whoever the heck Daniel Craig is contracted to. Yeah, calling paging Stefan Spielberger. Hmm. Yeah. Very good. Uh, Gordon Bennett was also known for pissing in a fireplace. Um, Wait, what? His girlfriend's fireplace, in full view of several guests. Yeah. Is his girlfriend the queen? Um, no, that's that's an artist. This is an artistic interpretation. Okay, <laughs> okay. this is. <laughs> that's the queen mother, actually, isn't it? <laughs> no, no, that that was that was the queen. You know, um, you know, my grandfather's not actually Santa Claus, right? What? Oh, my suspension of disbelief has been broken. I I also think Gordon Bennett um, needs to go to the doctor. That is not a uh, a normal stream, so to speak. Yeah, I don't know. Um, but yeah, pissing in a fireplace not great, eh? Um, but yeah, it's safe to say that's where he got his controversial reputation. Uh, anyway, after organizing several events in polo, tennis sailing, air racing, and even ballooning, Gordon Bennett decided to turn his attention to automobiles, and in collaboration with the Automobile Club de France, he founded the Gordon Bennett Cup, which would be held annually from 1900 to 1905. So when you said the 1920s, you were actually being quite recent. Let's take a look at 1902. The Second Boer War is coming to an end. You're right, guys, that's, that is the Second Boer War. Yes. Um, the very first... I know who won. Okay, no spoilers. Um, the very first science fiction movie is being made, and Australia has just allowed women the right to vote in national elections, providing they're not an ethnic minority. This is 1902, after all. Is the moon... has the moon been hit in the face by a bin? Yeah, I'm, I'm actually not sure what <laughs> a trip to the moon was about, but you're right, it does look like someone's just, like, picked up a, ki a can of Heinz baked beans and just gone, like... Yeet! Take that! Well, I suppose... I, su I, I might be going out on a limb here, but um, I feel like a trip to the moon may have been about, uh, I don't know, someone's journey to visit the moon, possibly. In a trash can, by the looks of it. In, in a bin. <laughs> in a bin. <laughs> that would make a lot of sense, yeah. They based, a, they based a TV show out of that. It was called Salvage One. Uh, they also based another movie uh, on that, um, Apollo 13. Mm. <laughs> they they based a live TV broadcast on that too. It was called The Moon Landing. Since oh. a French driver had won the Gordon Bennett Cup in 1901, the 1902 race would start in France, beginning in Champigny-sur-Marne, I do hope I pronounced that roughly correctly, on day one, before wiggling its way... Ooh! It's like fast-forwarded! Let me try that again. Ah! <laughs> None of my, none of my animation. Oh, there we go. Here we go. Okay, it's wiggling its way through uh, Nanges, Troyes, Longre, and Belfort. Uh, day two, which you can see in red, would be held in Switzerland and would visit Basel and Zurich. And then in day three, it got a little more wiggly and dangerous, heading through the Arlberg mountain range at up to 5,000 feet above sea level. Finally, the drivers would travel to the finish line at Innsbruck in Switzerland, in Aust sorry, Innsbruck in Austria, I've written that down wrong, completing the journey. What do you guys think about this, this route? Long, isn't it? Disjointed in some places. Um, <laughs> you could, there's like gaps in it as well, so that I, I'd take it those would have been uh, obstacles. Those are towns. Maybe. Those are the towns I was there's literally just talking about. There's Nanges oh, and Troyes and Longre, and yeah. Why, why does it go red? That's the second day. Did you not listen to what I just said? First, this is the first day. <laughs> oh, uh... So this is what they do on the first day of competition. This is what they do on the second day. And this is what they do on the third day. Oh, okay. Sorry. Um, yeah, no, that looks uh, that looks very um, interesting. That looks like a fun route. <laughs> <laughs> profound observation here we go <laughs> this okay is really part of the course for like most things we do yes <laughs> question two how far was this route closest answer wins so i'll give you a chance to look back at it starts up it up here like northern france goes down through switzerland wiggles through Liechtenstein, and ends up in austria how far was it 
Uh, I'm gonna say 962 kilometers. 962 kilometers. Let me let me write that down. Do, 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 do. Yeah, we are looking for kilometers, yes. We're not looking for miles. Uh, yeah, but if you say miles, I I can just translate. Okay. Well, I'm still sticking with 962 uh, kilometers. 962. Okay, Chris, would you like to say your answer? And please, if you can, can you translate it in, into kilometers? Oh. Well, Kilometers. I was gonna say 500. I was gonna say close to 500 miles. Well, I would drive 500 uh, miles. That's what 800 k's. Uh, let me look that up. Uh, and then they drove 500 more. <laughs> Just uh, to be the, the man, the man who that drove 500 miles. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, then my legs fell off. Okay, so Jack's. Jack's uh, answer was 962 kilometers, very precise. Chris's answer, even more precise, 804.672 kilometers. I can reveal that the right answer is... Do I have an answer screen for this? No, I don't. Great. Um, the correct answer <laughs> was 877 kilometers, which means... Who was even closer? You were both, like, either side uh, of it. Chris was, Chris, was, Chris was closest. But that, So you're 73 miles away, and Jack is... Yeah, okay, Chris won. We... Like 100, yeah. <laughs> okay, so that is a point for Chris. Well done. Yeah. Uh, where's my point sheet? Do, 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 do. do not worry, I can. I have the power of editing, so it will flow a lot more seamlessly than this. Um, okay, so the answer was 877 kilometers. Fun fact, this was actually run alongside the Paris to Vienna city to city, to city race, which was longer and arguably a larger event. That's almost like if F2 races started at the same time as an F1 Grand Prix on the same circuit, and then the F2 cars pulled off 40 minutes in, like, we've done our bit, have fun with the rest of the race. And then the F1 cars just went on and completed the Grand Prix. The past was make it weird. A bit more interesting these days. Do you know? I've actually seen a race like that. Um, when I went yeah, to yeah, it was a brick car race or something. Uh, not quite brick car. It was um, Creventic, the Twenty Four Hours of Silverstone oh, okay. in in um, uh, twenty eighteen. Yeah, um, they started with twelve hour cars and twenty four hour cars. Uh, the twelve hour cars were the ones that couldn't run through the night due to noise restrictions, and. Um, when their race was up, they got the checkered flag, um, but the 24-hour cars just kept running through to the next day. It was really weird. <laughs> you know what made it even weirder? The 12-hour race started before the 24-hour race, so they were only oh, actually what? sharing the track for about six hours. <laughs> that is bizarre. That's very bizarre. Right, should we move on? Yes. Okay, so now that we've met the organized... I'm taking control of this game, I should say. Uh, I'm dictating when we move on now. <laughs> you know what? Plus one bonus point for taking the initiative. Woo! <laughs> yeah. yeah! Right, let's move on. Okay. <laughs> um, now we've met the organisers in the course, let's meet the entrants, shall we? Okay. On one hand, we have the champions of 1900 and 1901, partly because they were the only entrants in 1901, the Automobile Club de France. Everybody boo! Boo! Nice. I'm a Yankee fan. On the other hand, we have the Challengers, the Automobile Club of Britain and Ireland. Everybody cheer! Yay! Nice Plus carpet. one point for Chris, way! <laughs> nice carpet. I wonder what nationality the game show host is. <laughs> hmm. Okay. I, w I wonder if we're all members of the same Commonwealth. Yes. Um, so basically, this was France versus Britain. Uh, there were originally going to be entrants from Germany and the United States as well, but unfortunately, they just didn't bother to turn up. So these are all you're getting. Uh, first well, German, up, Britain, Germany couldn't find them. Couldn't find them, yes. First up, re representing the ACGBI, Automobile Club of Great Britain and Ireland, uh, Wolseley. Now, Wolseley turned up with two Wolseley 30s, these beautiful cars that you can see here, which seem to have some kind of like steps for like ants or something on on the front is that is that how you get in yeah maybe no i, th I think wait that's what minute. this side bit's for I didn't, wait a minute i didn't know mo nun designed 
a Wolseley in 1902? Is that... How can you... How can you tell who it is? It's so pixelated. You know, the ens... I, I was referencing the ensign stepladder. Oh, the step ensign. Ladder. I get it. I get it. Okay. Um, so these are the Wolseley 30s, designed by the... They were actually designed by the man who would later found the Austin Car Company, and they were fielded by Lieutenant Commander Montague Graham White, a high-ranking British military official whose brother was a famous aviating pioneer, and Arthur Callan, a rich man who seemingly has no information available anywhere online and who literally only did this one race, which is why I couldn't find a picture of him, as you can tell. <laughs> Wait a second. It, this was some. This was fielded by Herbert Austin. Uh, I didn't even look up the name. Um, it's it's the guy who later founded the Austin Car Company. So I will put on screen who that is. I guess editing. Woo. <laughs> okay. Uh, also from the ACGBI, uh, this is businessman, cyclist, and former Australian Selwyn Edge. Yes, he originally, he was born in Australia and uh, gained British citizenship later on in life. Uh, he turned up with a Napier 50, painted in a coat of what may have been the first ever use of British racing green. Ooh, look at this green. Isn't that the greenest car you've ever seen, guys? Yes, it's quite oh, green, right. yes. Mm. Next up, France had bought a Panhard 70 driven by René de Nif. Here's an actual picture of René de Nif sitting in a Panhard 70. Isn't that amazing? Look at that moustache. He's rocked up in Brum. In Brum? <laughs> he's got he's got Nigel Mansell's moustache. <laughs> it does look like Brum. I'm sorry, I've just, I've literally just got that. I was trying to work out in what yeah. way he looked like he was from Birmingham, but no, this that, that does look like Brum. <laughs> Ooh, whoops. Ah, I'm touching all the wrong buttons again. Okay, so that's, there's René Deneuf. Uh, he was a driver famous for always starting his races wearing a cap, which would inevitably fall right off right after the start. Uh, René was an accomplished driver. Yep, yeah, he would start the race and his cap would just go, wee! <laughs> oh yeah, this picture I see. I see what you mean. I, mean, I to see. Be, to be fair, to be fair, um, look, to be fair to him, uh, Straps for caps hadn't been invented yet. True, and neither had helmets, ironically. Uh, no. Rennie was an accomplished driver who had already won five long-distance races, and he would later go on to be the first president of the CSI. No, not crime scene investigators, but the Commission Sportive Internationale, now known as the FIA. Uh, France also had a CGV entered by Leonce Girardot, uh, the G in CGV, who had won the previous year's Gordon Bennett Cup due to being the only driver to finish. Uh, the final He's entrant... Mike Wazowski. He is! Look at that! Oh my goodness! Are you going to come up with funny names for all of these cars? Oh my goodness. Well, let's, see how, let's see how many more I can do. Okay, well, we've only, we've only got one more entrant, so you've only got one more to, uh, to come up with. Uh, the final entrant, uh, also from France, uh, was a Moors Z driven by Henri Fournier, a man from Le Mans who would go on to set the land speed record later that year, also driving a Moors. What does this car look like? What, what is it? What? Uh, it looks he, like... He's... He, well, first of all, it looks like a it... mouse droid from Star Wars. <laughs> a what droid? A mouse droid from Star Wars. A mouse droid from Star you put Wars. That one on the Those are your six entrants. Question three. I just noticed if you go, if you go, if you go a slide back, actually, I've just realised uh. that car has that car has um like sort of fenders, but the fenders aren't covered, so they're just. Oh yeah! He's hovering over the wheel with no a top. Chicken wire. <laughs> what is that even <laughs> for? You gotta, you you gotta got... cover the fenders, <laughs> mate. You've got that on the last car too. What is that even for? His wheel caps are also like half bottles, by the looks of things as well. <laughs> um, this is a very int this is a bizarre vehicle in so many ways. Um, anyway, sorry, I keep interrupting. The uh, early 1900s, eh? Those magical men and their the driving machines. Okay, and question three. Card. Using only this context, who do you think won the race? Uh, we have Montague Graham White. He's the sergeant guy, high-ranking in the British 
whatever. Uh, you have Arthur Callan, who was the guy I found literally nothing about online and couldn't even find a picture of. Uh, you have Selwyn Edge, the guy who used to be Australian. Uh, you have René Denith, whose cap flew off at the start of every race, who had also done quite a bit of long distance racing. Uh, you have Leon Girardot, who was uh, who helped to helped to design and found the car that he was that he was driving. And you have Henri Fournier, who was driving a car that clearly had never heard of fenders. So, ye. Yeah. Uh, Chris, I'm going to go to you first. Which of these six entrants do you think won the race? Um, I'm going to say it was actually one of the Wolseleys. Um, You'll have to be more specific was, uh, than that. Arthur Mellon. Arthur Callan, the guy I've, Callen. the guy yeah. who literally no one's ever heard of. Brilliant. Okay, uh, Jack, who are you gonna hedge your bets on? Um, okay, I'm gonna say that mo first of all, most of these cars look very sort of funky and not particularly sporting. But I'd say the one that looked the most sporting and kind of dynamic out of any of them was the Moors. This is the car that I compared to... I think mm. this is the car that I compared to the Alstroid. Um, yes, it is. No fender, despite having no fender covers, for some bizarre reason, I don't really know why, um, I think that probably looked the most sports car-ish. And you could tell by the sort of motion lines that car is obviously moving very quickly uh, as illustrated by the painting so i'm going to say henry fournier was uh the one who won that one that would be number number f <laughs> i can count <laughs> um yeah, i'm going with f i've never heard of henry fournier only henri fournier <laughs> i'm going I'm, I'm going with f very good, very good. Well, I very much hope you don't end up with an F at the end of this one. Um, funnily Probably. enough, I am not going to give you the answer to this just yet, because we are going to watch the race play out. So, you will just have to, to keep your drivers in mind. Chris, you're rooting for Arthur Callan, and Jack, you're rooting for Henri Fournier. And uh, we shall see at the end uh, who ends up being being the winner. Uh, Jack, I see you, you weren't tempted by your fellow Australian, Selwyn Edge. Any reason by that? Well, I, I, this, I, again, I'm saying the, the cars all looked fairly funky. I mean, I know, I, know, I know Henry is just trying to be fancy with his name, mm -hmm. but he did look, that car did probably look more sporting than the most than the other ones. So I'm, that's the reason I went with that one. Very good. Oh, unprecedented double question. Question four. How many of these six cars finished the race? Chris, I'm going to go to you first. I'm going to say a very low number, probably possibly two. Two. Jack, how many do you think finished the race? Uh, I am going to say... I'm going to go with... Three. Well, actually, hang on. Were those the only cars in the race? Yep, there are only six cars in the Gordon Bennett Cup. Wow. Um, okay, that's interesting. Um, mind you, that, prob that was probably a high percentage of all the cars in the world at that point, so that kind of makes sense. Um, <laughs> okay, I'm gonna go with, um, I'm gonna go with three. Three, ooh, okay. Um, and remember what I said before about how there were actually more cars on the road, it's just that the others were doing the Paris to Vienna race rather than they they weren't like specifically gordon bennett cup entrance it's really weird how this all worked i don't understand but anyway we're only talking about the shorter race because we don't have time for the full paris to vienna rally okay let's get to the race so at 3 30 a.m oh jack are you paying attention the the yellow bit is where we are okay this is the bit that we're doing you got that thank you for clarifying that i really needed that good good Okay. At 3.30 a.m., the race began. Yes, apparently they decided to start at stupid o'clock in the morning for some reason. Partly because they wanted to get going before the main Paris to Vienna entries. Um, and also partly because they wanted to simulate what we're all going to have to do for the Australian Grand Prix this weekend and get up ridiculously frickin' early. Rawr! Don't remind me. Now you know the pain that we experience all year round. And Except now for this one weekend and a few others, but other than that. And now you also know what weekend this is being filmed on, but uh, anyway. Um, and the cars were sent off two minutes apart from, uh, from one another. Trust me, at the end of this race, those two minutes are literally not going to matter whatsoever. 
Uh, Girardot was the first as the previous year's winner, followed by Fournier. Edge started next, although he had to repair his gearbox before he could get going, correcting an error made during a previous repair. That's what they claim, anyway. Personally, I think his gearbox was just grumpy about being woken up at 3.30am and decided not to box gears anymore. He was still able to start on time, though, which meant he didn't actually lose any time from this. Next to start was Denis and then Graham White and Callan both got left behind as their cars broke down before the race even started. Yes, really. Oh no! If you're keeping track, that means all three British cars had mechanical failures before they even moved an inch. Go Brit! <laughs> no, they, and they went I on can, to I found can... British Leyland. <laughs> I, can, I can explain that. They Go on, just Chris. realized that their cars were British, therefore they didn't... They, it could they couldn't have worked indeed uh okay we're on to this bit now see uh after just 80 minutes denif and fournier arrived at the town of troyes uh where was the third french car you ask well leon girardot's cgv had cracked its fuel tank and retired from the race completing less than 140 kilometers of the original route by this point, the three British cars had all started the race, they're still in it guys, uh, meaning Girardot was the first official retirement from the race. You have to remember, even though it may seem silly to crack a fuel tank travelling at a maximum of about 30 miles per hour, this was on the roads of 1900s Europe, which were bumpy and unpaved, and mainly used for horses rather than cars. Next, it was on to Longre, but on the way, Henri Fournier had a clutch failure, forcing the race leader out of the race! Chris! Sorry, Jack! Henri Fournier is out! Oh, that's disappointing. And you receive an F. Uh, yeah, there we go. Well done. Uh, this means F's in the chat. F's in the <laughs> chat, guys. F's in the chat. I'm pulling that yeah. one out of the archive. <laughs> <laughs> Only one French car remained, and after Britain's rocky start, it looked as if it was the French whose reliability was failing first. Uh, the first day ended at the town of Belfort, and it was Denif who arrived first, setting the, fa the fastest first day time of not just the Bennett Cup, but the overall Paris to Vienna road race. Uh, at this point, he actually had a lead of over an hour and three quarters as the British cars lagged behind, with Edge arriving second, followed by Graham White, who didn't arrive until 3.30am the next morning, after 24 hours of solid driving. Arthur Callan, meanwhile, had become the first British retirement. Chris, F's in the oh. chat. Yes. Well done. Uh, so both of you guys are, are out, um, and we haven't even completed the first day yet. Great stuff. Uh, okay, so Arthur Callan, meanwhile, had become the first British retirement, with his car finally succumbing to early 1900s reliability somewhere along the way. At the end of the first day... Well, yes, Jack? You can get, with all those retirements, you can get your marker quill of doom out and uh, strike those off your, your probably hand-drawn spotter's guide. Well, you can see here, it's a, I've actually got the car's remaining thing on the top right. It says four, but that's because we haven't gone to the next day yet, so technically Arthur Callan is not out. So that's going to go down to three, which is what Jack predicted. So Jack, do you reckon that all three of these remaining cars are going to survive Switzerland, Liechtenstein, and the start of Austria? <laughs> uh, probably not, I suspect. Not looking good, is it? Not looking good. No. Okay, uh, at the end of the first day, three cars were out, and only three remained. On to day two! Look at this, we're lighting up the red bits now. Three cars remaining. Uh, day two of the Gordon Bennett Trophy took the competitors across the Swiss border and through the north of the country. There was only one problem with this. Question five! What's the matter? A. Motor racing was banned in Switzerland. B. Switzerland was at war. C. All of the remaining cars refused to start on day two. Or D, there were goats freaking everywhere! Jack, I'm gonna start with you. Okay, so I don't, so the motor racing ban hadn't come into effect yet, because that was after 1955, I seem to remember. Um, it wasn't a war yet, so I'm going to say, well, not that the war, that there was a war that I knew about, so I'm going to say it's probably not B, which, Amazingly, we are down to C and D, which are both ludicrous answers each. Um, and the, 
I can't believe I'm having to pick between these two. Uh, <laughs> wow. Uh, I mean, I feel like D is almost too random to have in there without that without there being an answer for this one. So I'm actually going to go with D. You think there were goats freaking everywhere? Okay. Well, I mean, okay. Well, I mean, yeah, I don't know. Well, you've locked <laughs> it in now. Chris, what are you going to say? You know what? I don't think it's as ludicrous as you uh, as you could uh, think. If I think it actually was the goats. Oh my goodness, I did not expect you guys both to go for the goats. That's brilliant. <laughs> okay, well I bet you're dying to know the answer. Uh, so let's find out. Pop. Uh, oh, I've completely missed it. Okay. Uh, what this was... is so far for the course for us. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't even have an answer. Where's the answer? What's the answer? I've forgotten the answer. No, I haven't. What, uh, where have I got? I've lost my script. <laughs> Believe it or not, motor racing was banned in Switzerland. Now. Yes. Why? Of course. While racing was famously banned in Switzerland from 1955 right up until 2019 due to the Le Mans disaster, it was actually banned for a brief period of time in the early 20th century too due to various other safety concerns. I truly don't understand why though. I mean, surely travelling at ever-increasing speeds along tiny winding dirt roads lined with trees and spectators in explosion-powered battering rounds filled with fl flammable material was as safe a sport as you could get back then. It's okay. Most of the drivers drank during the race, so it's all in good spirit. Anyway, I digress. <laughs> Unintended. <laughs> there you go. Um, because racing was banned in Switzerland, the entire day didn't count towards the race distance, but the cars were forced to do it anyway, because I guess they couldn't have just gone north to Germany for some reason. The organisers also set a minimum time for the cars in order to ensure that they kept to the speed limit. So question six. What was the national speed limit in Switzerland in 1902? This is a completely open question, so this is this is up to you guys. What was the speed limit in Switzerland in 1902? I'll go to Jack first. Um, was it 50 miles an hour? 50 miles per hour? Uh, Chris, what was the national speed limit in Switzerland in 1902? Lower, like five. Five miles per hour. Well, I'm not going to give you any points because you're both wrong, but then again, it was not really going to be an easy question anyway. Uh, the answer was 15 miles per hour. The cars were limited to 15 miles per hour. Uh, needless oh, to say... I one of the numbers right. Yeah, but I think if you'd have got within five, I'd have been like, yeah. But like, ten miles per hour, that's that's a lot when you're going that slowly. Needless to say, all three remaining cars completed the second day without the gaps changing too much, so Denif still had a sizeable lead over Edge and Graham White. However, the roads in Switzerland were even rougher than those in France, and an iggly wiggly little crack began to develop on Denif's differential casing. Just one day to go, and it was getting tense. We're on to day three now, guys. Three cars still remaining. We're on to day three. Okay, okay. On day three, the drivers travelled south past Liechtenstein until they reached the Arlberg mountain range, a popular place for skiing, but not necessarily motor racing. The road was treacherous, wiggling back and forth and forth and back between the mountains and reaching a maximum altitude of about 5,000 feet above sea level. Any engineers amongst my audience will know that cars often struggle at this altitude, as they can't get much fresh air into the radiators as normal, and the drivers struggle too since the air is thinner and colder. Somewhere along the way, Montague Graham White's car finally called it quits and broke down, succumbing to the crankshaft issue that had delayed it so much on the first day. We're down to two guys, we're down to two. Is anyone going to make it to the flag? What's going on? Ah! The other two cars didn't get away scot-free either. Upon inspecting their cars, Denif found that the crack in his differential casing was getting larger, and Edge found that the back of his car had suffered some damage and he'd lost all of his tools and spare parts. Presumably to this day, there are some lonely 1902 Napier parts just lying around in the Arlberg Mountains, frozen in snow or ice and just waiting to be discovered. All that was left then was a short 60 kilometers, uh, 60 kilometer dash to the finish line at Innsbruck. With only two cars remaining and a massive gap between the two, surely it was an easy victory from here for Denif. Right? Right? 
I suspect not, given the emphasis placed on that particular fact. I've seen this. I've seen this script before. No, you haven't. I haven't shared the script with anyone. <laughs> I've heard a story before. <laughs> Indeed. Uh, I went to nineteen eighty-eight. Anyone? Indeed. Well, not so fast, because 40 kilometers from the finish line, René Deniff's Panhard finally broke its differential and went no further. Whoa, who could have seen this coming? Ah! Can you guys even remember who's still in the race? No. <laughs> who's still in the race, guys? Uh, CG Singy? Oh, come on. <laughs> Okay, okay. <laughs> CGR, I think it is? No, not quite. Selwyn Edge cruised through and won the race for Great Britain. Selwyn Edge, the Napier guy, you remember? The, that guy? The guy who used to be an Australian? Oh, yeah, Edge, yeah. Jack, you should have backed your country. Oh the God, Australian guy won it. Oh, man. <laughs> Selwyn I'm Edge. Sorry, I'm sorry, I failed the country, everyone cruised through and won the race for Great Britain. His official finishing time was 11 hours and 3 minutes, and he was indeed the only finisher, so just one car got to the end. The finish line, it's gone yellow. One car remaining, Selwyn Edge wins. Woo! Uh, okay, uh, Selwyn went on to complete the full Paris to Vienna race, so he didn't just do the, um, the, the Gordon Bennett trophy, he went, like, over there as well. Um, wow finishing 7th, and he continued to have a successful career in motorsports for several years to come. Have I got a slight... Oh yeah, there he is! Look at that! This is the Selwyn Edge guy. Um, what have I... What have I... Oh, There's his trophy! I've... You can tell I made this... I made these slides so long ago, I can't even remember what they are. He made... He got a trophy of a man with a moustache! That's... That's <laughs> Gordon Bennett! <laughs> Come on, guys! You haven't been he paying might. such little oh, attention. Excellent. That's Gordon Bennett. He must, he must command his vehicles with such strength, given his incredibly long arms relative to the length of his legs. Yes, yes. Yes. <laughs> so we're going to talk about his mustache then. I think, to be honest, I think if anyone has a mustache like that or like that, that's just got to add like, you know, they call it a handlebar mustache because it adds extra grip, right? Well, actually, the thing is like um. And I remember this because of Nigel Mansell. A um, a moustache adds about uh, fifty extra horsepower. Mm, yeah. That's why in that's why he struggled in nineteen eighty eight. See, back in those the days, the moustache to arm length ratio is crazy. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> Oh, the, it's the Queen! What's going on? Um, let me continue to read the script so I can make sense of what I've just put on the screen. Uh, okay, uh, he continued to have a successful career in wood sports for several years to come. He married! That's why I've put the Queen on the screen. He married and had yeah. two kids. Where are the kids? Have I? Oh, I haven't put the kids on the screen. He celebrated his victory by urinating in a fireplace. <laughs> you remembered and something! Other, and Yay! The other child we don't have, and the other child we don't talk about. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, yeah, okay. He didn't actually marry the Queen, I would like to specify that, but he did marry. Um, and he also went on to buy the AC Car Company. Did you guys know that? He bought he f bought friggin' the Cobra Car people. I did really? Oh my gosh. Yeah! Okay. Cool. Which he helped to boost to prominence in racing, so you might actually have the Cobra to thank on this guy. Uh, in his later years, he became a farmer. That's why you saw the hat appear. That's my artistic representation of being a farmer. Uh, rising to the rank of con controller of the... Oh, dear. <laughs> controller of the dead person? I've killed him, dude. <laughs> I killed him. Yes, hello, I'd like to record a bird. <laughs> you see what well, actually 
JPEG is dead. You see, what actually happened is I thought there was going to be another image which had him being... Because the script says um, he, he rose to the rank of controller of the agricultural machinery department in the Ministry of Munitions, which is such a specific thing. I was sure that I would have like an artistic representation of what it means to be the controller of the agricultural machinery department of the Ministry of Munitions. So I thought... I thought it was going to have like a massive military combine harvester or something like that. And I was like, yeah, I'll just put that up on the screen. But no, the next slide is him dying. So R.I.P. He goes to the controller of dying. R.I.P. So I, I, I mean, that that's technically how the story ended. He technically dies. I mean, he, he it's natural causes and all that. But I mean, he's not alive anymore. So. So he's not been run over by his own thresher, has he? No, no, he hasn't. Uh, all the blood rushed to his incredibly long arms and he died that way. <laughs> <laughs> Do you like how I've just, I've literally just got him as if he's died like his instantaneously. Cat. He's like, oh yeah, I'm fine. <laughs> I've got my farmer's cap. I've got my trophy. I've got my lovely wife. Oh! His farmer's yeah, cap how... JPEG has left the building. <laughs> I love how the farmer's cap is just, <laughs> it's it's just in the air. floating. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you appreciate that and to be honest I'm glad I forgot that slide was there because I think that made it so much funnier <laughs> okay um yeah oh God, this uh so and the winner is hold on let me tally up the points insert winner's name here yay it's actually Chris oh. well done Chris you won oh. well, I win that how many well, of these have I lost? I think I've lost every time. Uh, I'll I don't give... think I've ever won. In all the years we've been doing this, I have never won a <laughs> single quiz that we have ever done. I mean, we haven't How done it in a while. Something? Uh, I'll no, give you a clue. I'll give you a clue, guys. Um, neither of you answered any questions correctly at any point today. <laughs> That's the genuine truth. No um, so Chris, Chris won because Chris won because he was closest in guessing how far the route was. That's that's the only reason Chris won that. What's what is so by it, default? Not, <laughs> he won by default. So what does he what does he win for that incredible feat? Uh, this hat. I am going to wear that farmer's hat, that JPEG, with pride. Well done guys, that's been Speed and PowerPoint, a spin-off of Game Show Grand Prix. Thank you all for watching. Bye bye! We may be back at some point. We might, we'll see. This might be a series if I can get the Australian out of bed enough.